scripture in the Bible is truth and not a book of fairy tales or fables. It is simply God's redemption plan for mankind to get back to God's true intended purpose, to tend and be stewards over that which God has given us, which is our terra firma, the earth, family, and the ongoing relationship with a loving God. There have been many questions to the subject of hell. Is it real? Are people and the devil there? Why would God create such a place for people who he loves so dearly? A large portion of the body of Christ have done away with these questions because of the difficulty in explanation or just running into those who don't believe in a creator responsible for creative design. These questions can be answered by anyone who is willing to journey through the scriptures and find the answers they seek. And so what I like to do is see if we can get some answers from the Bible. Many biblical scholars and theologians would agree that there has been about 6,000 years of mankind history since the days of Adam. As we dive into the scriptures, we must first understand we are 2,000 years since the days of the book of Acts in the Bible, which is when the church age actually began, or the day of Pentecost. And we must also understand context of who is speaking, and if it is universal or a direct teaching. Now, if we were to stop and think about something so simple, such as our emotions, we've all encountered happiness, sadness, and fear. Without someone physically harming us, or physically trying to bring about those emotions. This is something we cannot touch or physically see, but we know it is a part of us based on what we feel. This is what the Bible refers to as your spirit, which you can still experience while living in this earthly body and even after your physical body perishes. This is due to the fact that we are tripart beings like God. He is a triune God. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we were made in His image, made up of three parts. The soul, our mind, the spirit, the flesh, which is our body. Without the mind, you can't make any decisions as to what the flesh does for your spirit. Without the spirit, your flesh is completely dead. And without your flesh, you wouldn't be able to interact on this planet. As we talk about hell, think of it as a country with many states, capitals, and districts. The Bible describes five distinct compartments of hell. In the Old Testament, the Bible refers to the first part of hell as Abraham's bosom, a place where the righteous went when they died before the prophecy of a savior had yet to come to pay the debt of sin that entered the world by Adam's disobedience. This prophecy was mentioned in the first book of the Bible by God in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Abraham's bosom is also known as paradise, which is a Jewish custom not mentioned in the Bible. But once Jesus Christ fulfilled the will of God, death no longer had authority over the occupants of Abraham's bosom, and the righteous were led out of captivity to heaven temporarily according to God's plan. We get some light on this leading out of captivity, prefaced by Jesus in Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus is telling his disciples that once he completes the will of the Father, he will descend to hell, specifically to Abraham's bosom for the saints. We can also look at an incredible event stated in 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 13 through 15, where King Saul had previously banned all witchcraft and sorcery from the land, but really needed some answers that he was not getting from God. So he secretly got a woman who was a medium and spiritist from Endor. You can see where George Lucas got the inspiration for the Battle of Endor for the popular Star Wars timeline. But the spiritist was successful in bringing forth the prophet Samuel, and God actually allowed it. The spiritist goes on to say in verse 13, 
I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. And the prophet Samuel says to King Saul in verse 15, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? So it's confirmation that the location of this place is deep within the earth. The second part of hell is a great gulf that separates Abraham's bosom from the third part, which is Hades, a Greek translation of a place of torment, or Sheol, translated in Hebrew. Referring to Luke chapter 16, verse 26, we get an in-depth look of this gulf. We see that a once wealthy and unrighteous man who is in torment is trying to get the attention of Abraham for help and Abraham simply tells the rich man that there is a great gulf in between us that neither can one pass from Abraham's bosom to you nor you to us. And so to answer the question, is the devil and his angels and demons in hell tormenting people and can he leave when he feels like it to plot against the people he hates? Well, the answer is no. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, Peter tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That would mean the devil is on the earth, seeking whoever gives him the authority to wreak havoc in their lives, whether they know it or not, and not in hell, seeking whom he can devour. Because in hell, everyone is already devoured and in torment. Scripture clearly shows us in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 6, verse 7. Now there came a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. And so we see the devil is not in hell, but rather on the earth. And according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, the Apostle Paul tells us that the devil is the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh and of the mind. Now referring back to the phrase sons of God, in the Old Testament, it was referred to as angels or stars. In the New Testament, sons of God are mankind, now under a better covenant. Once the testator, Jesus Christ, fulfilled the ultimate payment of all sins. You may hear of some arguments that mankind in the Old Testament were referred to as sons of God from the lineage of Seth, as men began to call upon the name of the Lord since his birth but in the book of Job, we also find an irrefutable scripture. Job chapter 38, verse 4 through verse 7. God is speaking. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. And so in the book of Genesis chapter 2 verse 6 through 7, we clearly see that mankind was created after the earth was laid. And as we just read in Job, the angels were here before the earth was laid because they shouted for joy as they were watching God's creative work at hand. So the sons of God reference in the Old Testament cannot be men. The fourth part of hell is very interesting. It is only mentioned in the Bible once. If we look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness, to be reserved for judgment. The word hell here is not referred to as Hades or Sheol, but in the Greek translation, it is Tartarus, the deepest abyss of hell. If some of you are like me, you might be thinking, how can angels sin and be sent into chains of darkness if heaven's the good place where God is, meaning angels are good too? 
Well, we simply must look at these specific scriptures. Job chapter 4 verse 18. If he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error. The word error in Hebrew means folly. There are several times in scripture where you see the word folly. It is associated with some form of sexual immorality. When man began to multiply on the earth, the sons of God, angels if you will, came into the daughters of men, giving birth to hybrid offspring, which we know to be giants, or referred to as Nephilim, according to Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Now the book of Jude gives us a clearer picture in verse 6, stating, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. How angels are able to walk amongst men is simply shown to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14 through 15 that they have the ability to transform and Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 tells us that we have unwittingly entertained angels because of this transformative ability. What we take away is that God never intended on half angelic and half human beings. There was never a plan of redemption for that type of spirit. When the giant dies, they can't rightfully go to Abraham's bosom or hell. They would be stuck in a state of limbo. And this is why we see demonic activity on the earth today. Simply demonic spirits wanting a body to possess. The fifth and final part of hell is known as the lake of fire, which is mentioned throughout scripture, but mainly addressed in the apocalypse of the book of Revelations. Looking into the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verse 43, Jesus is saying, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed, rather than having two hands to go to hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. Now Jesus is not saying for you to actually do this, but he is simply stating how terrible it is to experience hell for eternity, just for satisfying your carnal desires now. If we focus on the word hell in this passage, the word hell in the Greek is the place of future punishment called Gehenna or Gehenna of fire. This was originally the Valley of Henna, south of Jerusalem, where the filth and dead animals of the city were cast into and continued to burn as there was always something being thrown into it, a fit symbol of the wicked and their future destruction. Now there isn't any part of hell that was created for mankind, but for the devil and his angels as stated in Matthew 25 verse 41. Furthermore, in the book of Revelations chapter 20 verse 10, we find that the devil, the beast, and the false prophet who have all deceived the nations are cast into the lake of fire. And then verse 14, death and the occupants of Hades itself are cast into the lake of fire after the final judgment. Those that have died before the work of Jesus Christ and rejected God's righteous and moral laws, or those who have rejected the knowledge of the truth since the time of Acts until this very day, have all went to Hades or Sheol and still have the lake of fire to look forward to. The most important question that many people have is, if hell was created for the devil and his angels, how is it that God is sending people there? After all, there are good people in the world. The most interesting thing is that God is not sending people there. We simply send ourselves. And to understand that, we must understand God's integrity and character of his word. God told Adam to tend, to run and have dominion over the earth, which will never change since God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Before we had the ceremonial and festival laws that we read about in the Torah of the Old Testament, God's moral law has always been here since the beginning. And because Adam willfully disobeyed and rejected that law in Eden, we now have to willfully obey and accept God to avoid complete separation. Now the beautiful thing about all of this is that God provided a way for us not to experience this separation for the actions of sin through his son Jesus Christ. 
For as by one man's disobedience, which was Adam about 6,000 years ago, many were made sinners. So also by one man's obedience, which is Jesus, many will be made righteous. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, sin was crucified, the curse was crucified, death was crucified, and you were crucified because of identification with him. When the crucifixion occurred, they all died, but one got up, which was Jesus, and rendered all inoperative. The sinful nature is still here, but the sin, the curse, the death's authority over you was destroyed. So the only one left standing is Jesus, and we are in him if we choose. Please realize there are sins we do every day, but there are sins we willfully can abstain from. The Apostle Paul also writes to the Church of Galatia with a passion on the issues of morality and shows us that those who call themselves Christians can't practice sin or lawlessness. He breaks down the list in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, and in the Greek meaning pornea, which today supports the billion dollar industry of pornography, including homosexuality, lesbianism, pedophilia, bestiality, incest, or necrophilia, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. All of these things we are to abstain from and not continue to engage in, yet we are not perfect beings. There are times where we miss the mark in pursuing holiness, doing other things that we may not realize we've done. And thank God we have 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, which states, But if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. This means we are continually being cleansed just by continually putting him first in all areas of our life. The Apostle Paul, with a great compassion, explains that where sin abounds, the grace of God abounds much more in Romans chapter 5, verse 20 through 21. Unfortunately, many people have been banking on the grace message to cover their sins, even knowing the sin they're about to do before committing the act, and that God knows your heart, which makes everything okay. But if we read the following verse, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 2, Paul simply says, don't you dare use the grace message as a crutch to continue living in your sin. Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, if you consider yourself saved by way of Christ, you now have a new nature living on the inside of you. And if you engage in the sins that were described without any conviction, then God places you in the category of a debased mind or reprobate stated in Romans chapter one, verse 28. In other words, iniquity has filled your heart and repentance meant nothing to you. In the Greek, to repent is the word metanoete which means to come to a new mind. The Bible never says for us to pray about our sins, but to simply get some self-control. With that being said, I hope this was very helpful to you. Please share, subscribe, leave questions and comments should you have any. If you'd like to receive the gift of salvation and putting God first in every category of your life, simply say, Father, Thank you for your word, that which is alive and true. You've said that so shall your word be that goes forth from your mouth. It shall not return to you void, but shall accomplish what you please. And according to Romans 10, 9, I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord and gave his life for me. 
that I may be reconciled back to you, and that you, Father, have raised him from the dead, so that his death would not be in vain, but so that I may have everlasting life more abundantly. And because of that, I am now yours, and no longer do I only call you God, but now have the covenant right to call you Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen.